main speaker, Shahina Gazamfa, and she's a plant taxonomist who specializes in floras of the Middle East. She has a particular interest and expertise in the conservation, biogeography, and plants of, of and, sorry, and plants and of, what am I doing here? And the economic status, I think, of plants and in the restoration of degraded and damaged lands of the Middle East. Sorry about that. She is honorary research associate at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, where she worked for over 15 years. She wrote The Flora of Oman, and she's currently a contributor and editor of The Flora of Iraq. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to hand you over to Shahina. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to get the whole... This, uh... Yeah, so we, we, we can see it, it was just, um, the, yeah, that's it, that's perfect. Thank you, Shahina. Okay, well, um, what I, I'm going to say good, good evening to everybody because I'm sitting in London, it's just about 6.30, but wherever you are, today is the day of Eid, and I wish all those who are celebrating today the, uh, the festival after Ramadan, so Eid Mubarak. I'm going to talk about the earliest botanic gardens mainly in the Middle East, and also their role in the conservation of plants of historical and cultural importance. Now, this was quite an important aspect of the earliest botanic gardens, apart from them being just pleasure gardens, which was quite rare out in the Middle East. So starting from there, uh, I've got uh, things on my screen. How can I get rid of those? Sorry, what have, we, we can see you, it fine. What have you got on your screen? Okay, I, I've, uh, I've, I've deleted, got rid of them. Yeah, it so, looks fine. Yeah, so from, from what I want to start with is that how did the Botanic Gardens got to be established? And what I want to say over here is that from the very early times, plants have traveled with, with people. They have traveled with humans uh, from wherever these humans existed and wherever they went to. These are plants which were used for food, mainly for food, but also for timber, where they were used for medicinal, uh, ob uh, medicinal uh, reasons uh, to make uh, objects, utilitarian objects for fragrance or just for, for um, as an ornament. They have always been intimate companions to humankind. It was only when the uh, people or humans started a sedentary mode of life, that means they started to settle in, they required that the plants which were around them, if it were necessary for them to exist, they started to domesticate them. And that was the very first botanic gardens or gardens were created. These were small plants that were mainly of, for food reasons. They were gathered and planted in areas which were easily accessible, so they didn't have to go hunting for these plants. Mm. So we have evidence going back to the Holocene and Neolithic times that domestication of crops very, had a very large impact on their distribution from their original, original localities. Um, there is uh, evidence from translocation of crops from other um, uh, instances. Uh, there, there's so a, a good amount of what documentation, uh, doc documentation does exist. Um, uh, through global human expansion, both crops and as well as an animals that were favored by humans, they also moved along, moved along and we now for many of the plants, we do not know where they actually uh, originated. And uh, over the last many years, uh, uh, people in, in botanic gardens, especially in Kew uh, and in the British Museum of Natural History, they have been trying to locate the origin by looking at the DNA of the very earliest domesticated plants from looking at herbarium specimens and the, the 
the earliest possible cultivars that they can find or know. Uh, according to Dorian, I mean, he's a, a sort of a, I would say an archeologist, uh, socio-archeologist. He suggested that th there was this food surplus from the middle to the late Holocene, and there was actual agricultural food surpluses. And he felt that these were responsible for actually networks of trade and people traveled taking their food surpluses, which they thought that they could sell and um, it could be traded well in these, um, from one place to another. We know that for a fact that very early in, in, um, in our uh, years from 2600 to 1900 BC from the uh, common era, there was sea trade involved in Oman, the Harappan civilization was basically in what is now part of Pakistan and part of India. So this is the Indian or the, it's, it's mostly the Indian subcontinent part of um, civilization. Uh, they were already in sea trade with Oman. These are the Gulf countries in the Arabian Peninsula, in Bahrain, in Iraq. Uh, from 4000 BCE, there was trade established with Egypt. There was trade prevalent between India and the Gulf. And again, cross-cultural contracts were made between societies, East Africa, South Asia, Arabia, Southeast Asia. And that is, I mean, we know it from the crops that were taken from one particular area, from their origins into another one. Also, the names that were given to these plants or animals, um, the linguistic people, the people who do linguistics, they were able to actually see how they originated. And as well from the technology of the boats, uh, it was also evident. Between Northeast Africa and India and Arabia, trade existed and was pretty, pretty much uh, flourishing during this time. And by the end of the third millennium, there was sea trade well established between the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. So it's not really surprising that there was trade in between all these countries, that the plants also moved either for trade, uh, for timber, for uh, medicines, or just for ornament purposes. The uh, coming down into more in the Middle Eastern areas, the Egyptians uh, believe that the process of cultivation, it was taught by the god and it was a blessing as far as the pharaohs considered that, and they wanted to start cultivation. Uh, the documentation of the earliest con uh, cultivations was known on the flood plains of the Nile, and there is um, evidence or documentation around that time in the 1800 to 1801 BCE, the 12th dynasty of the pharaohs. Uh, the ancient Egyptians, of course, did not only cultivate plants for food, but they grew them in their funerary parks, in temple gardens, because they always considered uh, putting them for the, the, the dead. I mean, it was, it was very much a thing with the, with the Egyptians. Funerary uh, collars or floral corals were found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. And there's one example that I give up here in the uh, top uh, right hand corner. Uh, and it had leaves of olive, which were sewn in together with other leaves, but one prominent one was actually olive. Olive does not grow in Egypt just by chance. So these were actually grown for the purpose because they were sac sacred to, to the people of, um, of Egypt at that time. And they were given to the more um, reverent, the more like gods or, or, or kings. The planting inventories which were found, they included carob, Christ thorn, date palms, doom palms, finks, moringa, myrtle, pomegranate, sycamore, tamarisks, and willow. Many of these uh, plants actually do not, are not indigenous to Egypt, but they was brought in, cultivated, and were used for various purposes from food to um, uh, uh, basically as, as garlands of of floral collars. Uh, 
now I've gone back. Uh, as far as some of the pl food plants were concerned, we know that in Egypt and in Mesopotamia and Iraq, both wine and viticulture was known as early as 3000 BC. And this has been, this is evident from the um, kind of murals or frescoes which are present in Egypt in, and have been discovered in various temples or in the pyramids. The ancient Arabs, these are reliefs which are found in, um, uh, in Persepolis. They show the ancient Persians going off with their wine uh, uh, vessels. Uh, the Chinese received wine through the missions of Chankian around 128 BC and they basically traveled to the eastern provinces, Bactriana. None of these provinces actually exist now, but this was what was ancient uh, for all the, all the land basically from Persia down to China, including Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, Sogdiana and Farhana. And they took along with them many fruits, uh, including wine. Um, the little vessel on the left-hand corner the Chinese actually developed a special vessel to drink wine, uh, which, which is pictured here. Now, when you come actually to his botanic gardens, they were basically developed uh, from, um, oh dear, this has come back again, from uh, physic or agricultural gardens. Uh, the original gardens were basically meant for either medicinal purposes or to develop agriculture. Later on, they became as to showcase horticultural ability. Can we grow this plant, which, is, which doesn't exist here? Can we grow it? Or, and amenity, of course. During the 19th and 20th centuries, botanic gardens were completely transformed from just being of exotic plants, and they became institutes to study and research the plants that were there and also to some extent to conserve them. So it's only in the last centuries, the 19th and the 20th centuries, that the, the botanic gardens actively pay, played a role to conserve and um, basically study or use it for education purposes. And over here, I have a, a few objects over here, which, were, uh, which are in various botanic gardens. Uh, the, the first two photographs are basically from Kew, uh, these are these are fairly recent collections. One in the in the uh, in in in, in the uh, Princess of Wales Conservatory, and one in the Lily Pond. Many of the plants, or all the plants, I should say, in both these are non-British or even perhaps non-European. But they have been planted over there, not necessarily just for amenity but for research and for educational purposes. Economic botany collections were also considered as a part, very much an expansion of the botanic gardens and plants which contributed towards the, the uh, livelihood of humans basically were also exhibited. Many of them are from the Kew collections, but I have collections from Harvard collections, from uh, the botanic gardens in Ireland, so on. These are, again, they give, give us some sort of an idea of what these plants were used for, or possibly not anymore, but what they were originally used for. So the origin of the botanic gardens, the earliest known botanic garden, as we may call it a botanic garden, was in Egypt, 3000 BC. It was planned by Necht, who was the head garden, uh, gardener, and these gardens were attached to the temple of Karnak. Again, it was a temple garden, a royal temple garden. It was basically surrounded, I mean, a, a tank with a rectangular uh, area. It had doom palms, it had, it had um, uh, pergolas of vine and lotus. And prob probably it was uh, we don't know, but probably what people who have been working on it think that it was a pleasure garden more than anything else. Now, amongst the Greek, the early Greeks described plants. They were very good with the, with the description of plants, but these they did not cultivate. So they 
um, the only existence of anything of a nature of a botanic garden is the men mention of Aristotle's garden at Athens. He left that garden to Theophrastus, which, who was a student of uh, Aristotle. He equipped it further, improved on it, and then his Dehistorium de Plantarum was based on this garden. So we are actually coming into 370 to 287 BC when his when the Dehistoria Plantarum listing about 500 plants was actually mentioned. In the Middle East, uh, basically Iraq was fairly well developed as perhaps you know that it was uh, a part of the Fertile Crescent and um, Sinaheb Palace is in Nineveh in Iraq, which is in the sort of west, northern west corner of Iraq. Uh, claims to be what is possibly the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon were reputed to be called as that because they had or they showed if people, if somebody was walking towards the garden, as the plants were in a tiered fashion. So it, it appeared that they were hanging down from the sky. And um, uh, in 2013, Stephanie Daly from the Oxford Botanic Garden, she wrote a book on the mystery of the hanging garden and also putting the information together. Um, she thought or she sort of established that the hanging gardens of Babylon were actually not in Babylon, but were, they were in Nineveh. We had a very uh, sophisticated watering system. They had plants that were exotic plants that were not found in Iraq, and they, they were mostly for pleasure, but also they grew plants for food, which were used in the palace. Sennacherib was a, a new Assyrian uh, king uh, of, of, the, of the new Assyrian empire in 705 to 681, taking over from his father, I think, which was Sargon II. Uh, the Ashurbanipal's palace, again, in, in Nineveh, uh, overlapping the same thing. And I think they're talking about the same garden. This was uh, shown on the uh, one of the um, reliefs in, in, the, in the palace gardens. It actually showed the plantations, as, as you can see, with central paths going and the beds and what we what they had. It is very difficult to obviously identify all the plants, but cypresses, uh, uh, date palms are sometimes quite evident in these. Uh, a list of plants which was given in the garden of Merodach Baladan. He was the king of Babel, Babylon in Iraq during the same time as uh, Sinacherib. And this is from the clay tablets uh, in cuneiform text, uh, showing the plantations in each of these beds, the names of plants which uh, are in each of the beds. Uh, I uh, do not know what the names of the plants are, but they are basically, which has been deciphered as plants. And here is a, 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 what he kind of looked like. Oh dear. Now the origin of bot botanic gardens, as far as I see, the real founders perhaps were the Chinese. And during 140, 86 BC, the emperor, the Han emperor, emperor, emperor who had the big Han um, empire in China, Wu Ti, his name was, he sent out people basically to collect plants not only from the southern parts of China, but sent them out to various parts to where they could go, uh, mainly to Persia and further up because the bananas, as you can see, the, these were brought back and planted in the gardens. These planted were from for all, they were food plants, they were plants which were for uh, amenities and medicinal purposes. So basically the, the actual planting of the gardens was started where they could plant the gardens for various plantings, sending out people mainly for the, for the um, benefit of the gardens. Uh, lychee, Arica, Catechu, the bananas, Kiscalis, Canarium, 
uh, synonym, canna, indica, the, and, and the oranges. These were all brought in. And the ancient Chinese authors think that Wu Ti uh, introduced the vine, pomegranate, safflower, the beans, cucumber, lucerne, coriander, and walnut. None of these plants are indigenous to, to China, but they were all introduced a very long time ago and became a part of, of, chi of, of what they ate. Gardens were established a little later in Spain by the Muslims, but these were gardens mainly for agricultural crops. Uh, the Rusafa garden was in Cordoba, and these were basically the precursors of the European Renaissance gardens. So the, in the eighth century, the Umayyad uh, Amir Abdurrahman, he built a garden in um, 11th century, and in the eighth century, it, it was the Amir. In the 11th century, um, a garden was built, which was uh, Al Munayat Al Mansura, the Victory Garden. Uh, in Seville, uh, the Caliph Abu Yaqub uh, Yusuf built the Bohera Garden. So these were the gardens, these were built, but mainly for the purposes to research agricultural crops. Uh, and, 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 and it explains in the next uh, uh, paragraph this in, um, in, um, in Al Andalus, which is uh, Andalusia. Many of the agron agronomists carried out experiments. There were all sorts of experiments in these gardens. They wrote great big theses on agriculture, and some of them were really translated into lat Latin and used. Now, some of the experts in that were Al Zahrawi, uh, Ibn Wahid, uh, Al Tignari, Abu Jair, uh, Abu Al Awam, uh, and Ibn Layun. So they were all, but you know, this, this is one which is uh, from the linseed oil, a photograph of it, basically studying the production of linseed and uh, consequently linen. The early Britannic gardens now we come into Europe. Unfortunately, we have to leave because nothing much was happening. It was the dark ages, as you may say, in the Middle Eastern region, but the early Britannic gardens were always the physic gardens, not, not, not necessarily just in Europe, but also in the Middle East. They were made uh, through cultivation and proper documentation they considered was paramount in preserving the history and uses of many plant species. Many of you would know that the earliest botanic garden was in Padua in Italy, founded in 1545. And it is, or it still exists and it is still continues it's the world's oldest academic botanical garden. And that is the older and the sort of new photograph of it. Uh, it has, since it was established, a lot of modern disciplines, uh, botany, medicine, chemistry, ecology, pharmacy. They were starting to uh, investigate and experiment and research in, these, in this garden. Oh, it's very... Um, in Paris, the garden was established in 1635, again, as a royal garden of the medicinal plants. That was the original purpose of the plant. It was founded uh, by Bruce, who was the physician of Louis XIII. And until uh, 1635, it was always used as a medicinal herb. Later on, it became to be planted with more uh, uh, plants and became more uh, as an amenity garden as well. The earliest, some of the earliest uh, people or, or uh, collectors were then sent and this particular herbarium uh, plant, uh, I, I must admit I was studying this, which is on the uh, right hand corner. Uh, many of the plants were brought back as seeds. They were grown in the Paris Botanic Garden and the cultivated plants were either grown there or if they couldn't grow there, they were preserved for research or to other uh, herbaria or to other research institutes. Of course, in London, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the Chelsea Botanica or Chelsea Physic Garden, again, starting as a, a, a garden just meant for the, it was the apothecary's garden. 
and it was basically meant for training apprentices in identifying plants. And these were plants of medicinal value, pharmaceutical, they were gardens of world medicine, and then garden which had only the edible and useful plants. One of the plants which is found over there is Salvia indica. This plant is uh, native to Palestine, Jordan, Syria, sort of in the Middle Eastern areas. It was described in 1762. It was first grown in Britain by Miller, Philip Miller, who grew uh, many plants. And at the same time, he introduced it and, and brought it, it was first time grown in the physic garden. It's a medicinal plant, which is used for various purposes, but that's where it's first started. The University of Oxford Bot Botanic Garden, uh, again, was one of the oldest gardens in, uh, in, in UK. In, uh, in fact, in Europe, it was founded in 1621, again, as just as a physic garden, growing plants for medical uh, medicinal research. But today, of course, there are 8,000 different species and it is uh, a very diverse botanic garden with, with lots. But if you have visited the Oxford Botanic Garden, there is a place which is meant for medicinal um, ailments. So plants, say for example, of all skin diseases or skin complaints are planted over there. But these are of course plants that, are, that can be grown in, um, in our climate. Now, several botanic gardens basically conserve and exhi exhibit plants and through proper research and documentation help in preserving uh, their cultural history. Kew Gardens is one of them, founded in 1759 um, by Princess Augusta. <clears throat> and it became one of the major uh, uh, sort of botanic gardens in the British Isles, in fact, uh, for, for Europe. In 1841, Kew became a public botanic garden and under the direction of the first director, which was William uh, Hooker, it uh, expanded from um, a smaller part, which was just the palace garden into a public garden, combining uh, two gardens together. It also had or made a museum of economic bot botany and it became one of the leading botanic gardens and a scientific institute as it is today. Some of the historical collections or introductions in this were that of ginkgo, which is a plant planted in there in 1762, uh, the maiden hair fern tree, it still exists today. Another one is Sephora japonica. It was the Japanese, uh, called Japanese native to China. It was introduced, came to Britain in 1753. Uh, it was brought to Kew, planted over there in 1762. So some of these uh, plants still exist as possibly for historical purposes. The orangery that, that was established in 1761, it was mainly designed for the cultivations of oranges and limes. Uh, of course, now it is just uh, a cafe. For purposes of conservation, uh, this is happening now, but uh, it is still important to say that, as this may um, help to conserve the plants that may ob obviously go into extinction. A very small, a very, very tiny, because you can see the, the, the extent of its um, uh, diameter across is just one centimeter. It's the smallest water lily, Nymphia thermera, uh, it was kind of saved from extinction. It is wild in Uganda, I think, or Rwanda, sorry, and then brought in as the seed. Uh, probably it doesn't exist in Rwanda anymore, but it does exist here in Kew. Another plant, mostly for amenity or for its awe aspiring, was the Amorphophallus titanium, which is one of the giant. Um, lily plants, as you may call it. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about the botanic gardens in, in India, because apart from Lalbagh Botanic Garden, which was which is in Bangalore, many of the other major botanic gardens were established during the time 
of the, Brito of the British colonialism. And they were established for various reasons. The Lal Bagh Botanic Garden in Bangalore was started by Heather Ali and carried on by his son Tipu Sultan. And they made a very large, of course, during the time uh, apparently of the, by the British, made uh, a big glass house. And uh, even up to today, uh, an annual sort of flower show is held in that. The Acharya Jagdish Chandra Bose Indian Botanic Garden in, in Calcutta, that was established in 1787. So a long, you know, quite a long time ago uh, and established the Botanical Survey of India, which was again an institute existing even today, which basically does its research from taxonomy to medicinal plants, to uh, plants of horticultural importance and so on of Indian plants. So they established that institute uh, and in, in uh, Calcutta. The oldest possible uh, banyan tree, which is this great attraction, is a 250 year old uh, uh, banyan tree. And over here you can see that the, you know, the banyan tree, the roots come down, these are area roots, and establish themselves in the ground. So this tree, which you see in the, in the right hand corner, is just one tree, but the roots have come and established themselves. In Uti, the Government Botanic Garden was established in 1848, and this was a high altitude garden established at about 2000 meters in the Nil uh, Nilgiri Hills. And it was the pioneer garden which introduced uh, vegetable spices, condiments, ar aromatic plants in India. It had also included uh, chinkona, which is uh, the, the plant to deal with or cure malaria from which cunine is uh, extracted from the bark of it. Uh, the, this plant basically was growing, grow, grows in uh, Peru and it was brought by, so that's another interesting story brought by the British finally and it is one of the plants planted quite early in the Indian Botanic Gardens. The Forestry Research Institute in Dinadum uh, started much later, it was in 1934, but it played a very role, an uh, important role in the introduction of forest trees. It was an institute for forest, forestry research. Uh, it also basically um, looked at all the plants that were indigenous and how could they be used for Indian, either economic, uh, for economic uh, value or for ornament. Right. So preserving the cultural value of plants. Now, as, as, as I see it, there is, there is global climate change happening. There is human impact. The natural habitats of many plants and animals are being lost or they have changed. I mean, this we know it from various research, various papers which are published. Many species can no longer survive in the, in the native areas of distribution. And it's not just plants, it's also animals. And we all know that. But what happens with plants? When a plant species is lost, there's a history and a culture that is associated with it in its native environment. That is, all, that is lost. Plants can be cultivated, but I would love to know the plants that are cultivated in Kew, how many people would know the history of those plants and the culture that is associated with those particular plants. That is one part which the, the, the new botanic gardens can take on by establishing gardens, which would be mainly uh, of plants that are valued by different cultures, if they can grow in this particular environment, and simply to express their history and a certain culture that is associated. And I will let you, uh, I will show a few slides um, on, on that. Religious texts are very important because religious texts like the Quran, the Bible, the, the Reg Vidas, they have been there for a very long period of time and people read them and there are plants mentioned in these texts. And they, through those texts, they can preserve the history and the sort of cultural significance for a particular religion or for a particular group of religions of those plants. And this is something that the botanic gardens can do. Date palm for, for one, it's mentioned in the Quran. 
It is mentioned as a food for enjoyment. It provides shade. It symbolizes wisdom. It's, it is suggested you conserve it. It helps in childbirth and it is a source of fiber. These are all its uses which are given in. And in the countries where uh, date palm does grow, these, this culture still exists with the plant. The date palm probably taken and grown now in the United States of America or other countries probably don't have that culture and history associated with it. It is just used as a very nice food source. Uh, in the Bible, again, it symbolizes holiness because uh, 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 Mary gave birth to apparently by holding onto the branches of the date palm. It symbolizes resurrection, justice, righteousness, honor, and many, many geographical place names in the uh, area of Israel, Jordan, Palestine are associated with palm groves. So there's a lot of history and culture attached to this. In Hinduism, the trees have been worshipped as a matter of gratitude. The Hindus believed that the trees give them life, they give them food, they give them uh, medicine, and they therefore they are almost to be uh, worshipped. And in the ancient Vedas, and this is going back, you know, several, uh, I do not know, six, seven thousand years, the Rig Veda and the Athara Veda, they trace back the history of plants and their uses since ancient civilizations. And there are five plants which are mentioned in the Vedas that are considered very sacred. Uh, cannabis sativa, also known as Vajaya, uh, which has been translated from Sanskrit. It is well, it is known for the connection to Lord Shiva. And so it goes that Lord Shiva had once a feud with his family and he walked off and there he was, he smelled the plant uh, of, of cannabis and that calmed his nerves. And he realized that this plant exhibited some sort of properties as a driver into the higher consciousness. So it is sacred in the Ayurvedic scripts. Tulsi, which is Osimum Basilicum, uh, every re religion, uh, Hindu sort of religious practice is marked with Tulsi leaves and it symbolizes purity. Sandalwood, because of the beautiful Smeritam, it is, um, it, it is very much a sacred tree and a lot of the, the, the sandalwood powder uh, is used as a kind of a fragrance with, with the, the, the thing that is put on the, on the forehead. Uh, as a kind of a sacred or a symbolism before you enter temples or on, on religious days. Jasminum, it is also identified with Lord Shiva because of its beautiful aroma. It is effective in controlling the mind. And then Neem uh, or Zadirachta Indica or the Indian lilac, that is the last of the fifth sacred plants. Um, it stands for its resemblance to the goddess Durga sometimes referred to as a Devi. It's a very medicinal plant and uh, planted mostly in everywhere where there may be uh, Indian habitation. Uh, it, it's got properties for, it's got several antibacterial properties, but originally it has been mentioned uh, in the ancient Vedas. Grip is another one. It is mentioned in the Quran. It is mentioned in the Bible and in the Hebrew texts. It is a blessing in association with different aspects of life and ethics. Um, references made with rainwater, it brings life. So it, it, it is basically associated with giving life. It is associated with wisdom, it enjoyment. It is associated with good thinking and abstinence from intoxication. Now we would never, I mean, in, in, a, in a Western world would have all the other associations with it, except that, yeah, it's good to taste and it does give a little bit of intoxication taken in smaller quantities. In the Bible as well, it is associated as a refreshing drink. Uh, it was used as a season marking thing that when the grapes become ripe, it is this particular season, uh, when should they be pruned? When should they be cultivated? But it was also said that they lack good wood. It was not for burning. Uh, pomegranate is another one. 
which is now barely grown everywhere and it is now one of the new superfoods. In the Quran, it is a blessing. It is a symbol of paradise. It is a symbol to be not to be excessive, to share uh, in the Bible, uh, which the, the name in the Quran is the same as that is used in the Bible and in Hebrew. It is uh, gives as a reference to women of beauty from the red color. Now, uh, pomegranate is grown now practically everywhere that it can grow, but the context or the, the message that it has is uh, or can only be shared for somebody who can explain why or where it originally comes from. In ancient per Persia, where actually it originates, it was a celebrated fruit amongst the Zoroastrians and they considered it as a symbol of eternal life uh, and this and fire as, the, as we probably are aware. It was a symbol of strength in Persian culture. It was a symbol of fertility, prosperity, righteousness and eternal life uh, by Jews and ancient Egyptians. And it is, of course, in, uh, in the Muslim religion, it was considered as a fruit that purged the body and spirit of jealousy and hate. So the pomegranate was quite, quite an uh, important fruit. Olive, again, I'm sure everybody knows much about olive. In the, it's mentioned in the Quran as bearing oil. It's a blessed and a useful tree. It's mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in other historical uh, or uh, religious texts uh, as basically beneficial, as something which brings light, refer being referenced, but also a symbol of peace, as we well know from, from uh, Noah's Ark, when the pigeon came in with an olive branch in its... Uh, in its beak. It is a symbol of righteousness and a symbol of integrity. So these uh, are some of the plants which are mentioned in religious texts and perhaps uh, my recommendation or my uh, thing would be to create gardens in the existing botanic gardens to aware or to make aware people of their cultural significance, not just as plants which have been used for medicine or just for amenity, yeah, they look very pretty, but also that they have a cultural or a culture associated with them in various religions dating back to two or 3000 years. That's uh, now for me, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shahina. That was a really fascinating survey. Uh, yeah, do feel free to, for everybody else if you'd like to send your videos back on. Um, I just thought how interesting it was to see how early the movement of plants was happening and you really brought out so well all the kind of cross-cultural connections and the way plants are move, you know, kind of moving around the globe. I like the way you were stressing how important botanic gardens are for research for conservation and also you're kind of where you were talking about when you lose a species you don't just lose the species but you lose the kind of history and the culture that goes with it and I think people in the chat were pointing out how interesting it is to look at references to plants in religious texts and see the kind of symbolic meanings as well as the the uses of the different plants we're going to go on um, you and you covered just such a wide range of, of kind of geographical areas we went from the middle we explored the middle east we ex went to china to Spain and then across Europe and India it was just such a wide ranging, fascinating talk. So thank you so much. We've got some um, questions coming through in the chat. So please, if anyone else would like to ask questions, please do. And if there's somebody who'd like to ask questions in person, please do pop your hand up. Oh, by the way, I hope my um, I've, I've lost that echo. I was getting lots of messages about it earlier on, but hopefully it's kind of sounding OK for now. So if we can just go to you, David, and if you could pick up some of the questions from the chat, if that's OK. Yes, we've got a, we've got a few. Um, I'll just ask them in order. Uh, so, well, K Kieran stuck one in. He's, he's probably allowed to unmute himself and ask if he wants. But K Kieran asked, you mentioned one of those gardens was uh, possibly the, the origin of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. What, what are the other options? What are the other alternatives that might be that? Shahina, do you want to unmute yourself? 
uh, and not not a not a lot, but 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 they basically thought that the hanging gardens of Babylon should be in Babylon. So the remnants of an old garden would be probably considered as that that these are the remnants of the botanic gardens. But when uh, it was starting, when the research started by Christine, she basically um, saw that there was a canal and uh, which was possibly used to water the gardens and then looking at some of the reliefs and some of the areas where she went to in Nineveh, she um, suggested that these possibly were the hanging gardens of Babylon. It kind of uh, fitted in more. Yeah, fascinating. Um, another question we had from, from Becky was, were, were all these botanical gardens you were talking about private gardens or were they open to the public? Not all of them were open to the public. The, the older botanic gardens or the older gardens were basically palace gardens. So they were attached to palaces or to funerary parks, but mainly from, the, uh, from, from people of higher rank. So possibly not uh, open to, to the public. Excellent, okay. Um, I'm just looking around. So somebody was asking about the, the neem oil plant that you mentioned. Is that something that can be used to control garden parasites? Is it, is it the neem or the deem? Neem. I think N-E-E-M, neem. Yeah, the neem. Yes, it's supposed to be very antibacterial. It's supposed to, you know, people now uh, take uh, twigs of neem and put it amongst their clothes. It stops um, moths and other uh, insects getting into your clothes. Uh, neem uh, leaves, which, which are crushed and made into powder, is used as toothpaste. Uh, it's made into soap. So it is uh, considered, yeah, very antibacterial. Lots and lots and lots of research and papers on neem. Uh, but in its very crude form, people do take twigs and leaves from it uh, and use it quite commonly. And they may even soak it, put uh, in, in water and uh, 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 irrigate or you know sort of water their plants to get rid of pests yeah excellent thank you um we've got a few more i'll, I'll go through this hopefully we can get to all these if anybody adds any more we probably won't get to the other ones but we'll do this um so kennedy's asked you, you talked about global history is it, much known about sub-saharan african gardens things like the palaces of benin ancient zimbabwe uh, I don't know, and I haven't done any research for the African gardens. I'm sure they must be, but what remains and what was documented, uh, I'm not too sure. Excellent. And, and there was a question also about the, the scale of these gardens. Do we have a sense of how, how big they were? Oh, uh, I mean, they, they, they're in some of the gardens, yes, they do give uh, areas. Uh, but uh, I mean, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Yes, they were they were quite large, especially the one which is uh, considered to be the the hanging gardens, in um, by made by Sina uh, Uh It must be quite large because there was there were rows of trees which were growing by the side of the main pathway, as 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 you see, and just and from looking at the terraces that was there. It appears that it would be quite a large garden. Hmm, fascinating. It's, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to stick one of my questions in because I can, when, you know, I'm asking them. Um, one of the things that took me is interesting, you, you talked about a lot of the plants that are mentioned in religious texts and things. How easily can we work out when texts that were written quite a while ago before the modern way we think of species content, how, how confident can we be that we can work out what species that we now understand is being referred to in some of those ancient texts? Oh, quite, quite well, because I mean, I think there are people, especially um, the Hebrew uh, texts, uh, plants that have been written for the Bible or plants in the Bible, they have more or less all been identified. Uh, and um, those in the Vedas, which I was reading just quite recently, apart from a couple, Suma or Somu is one plant which they have not been able to identify, but quite a number of plants have been, they have been able to identify, mainly, mainly either through their description or through the uses. Uh, so I have myself identified all the plants or written actually on the Quranic plants. So 
the, all the chronic plants are identified. Some, of course, you know, not always directly to the species. There are always alternatives, but within uh, one or two species, they are identifiable. The, I was with a project with the de deciphering or looking at plants which were in cuneiform text. So people who can read um, the cuneiform text um, approached uh, Q and, and myself because we were working for Iraq, for the flora of Iraq. And again, these plants were by not by name. They were that it had a root like that. Uh, it grows at this particular time, or it's used for that. It has this sort of a fruit, or it has a, a, a leaf which is very raspy. Putting those, putting that information together, and looking at the plants which are in the flora of Iraq or in Iraq grows, and to what purposes they are used for, we could identify quite a number of those as well. So it is possible to identify. It just takes, uh, yeah, it takes a bit of time, but yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. It really, it really is that sort of detective work almost. Um, so I had a question from Tim Rogers. He said, do, do you have any suggestions as to why gardens drifted away from being physic and agricultural gardens to being sort of purely horticultural showcases? I think it was just arrogance. Uh, starting from the kings and the queens, and it was the time uh, in the in the sort of 18th and the 19th centuries that people could travel and they could bring in exotic plants, plants that were just pretty. And and most of these countries, like Britain, France, they had their colonies. They weren't looking necessarily for uh, food plants as such, but wherever they did find them, they brought them back something specially nice, tasty. Uh, but mostly um, uh, these were amenity plants and these were taken not necessarily because they were they were you know they were considered high class in a way so all the stately homes they had they had them and they kind of showed them off as very pretty plants especially orchids these were one great things to grow and to be able to cultivate orchids cedar was another one which was brought in every stately home had a cedar plant or a cedar tree uh, Canna, canna lily was another one which was brought from India uh, into here. So it wasn't just, it was just, I, I think, uh, 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 more as a, uh, a case of um, showmanship. Thanks. And I think one, one last question that people have put, um, and I'll, I'll combine two, because I, I think the way, I like the way Becky's asked it. She said, if, if you could go back in time and visit any of the historic gardens you've mentioned, which one would you most want to go back and see? I think I would like to go to Egypt. I think their gardens were uh, quite well established. Not much remains of it, but but from from the reliefs and uh, from the uh, little bits and pieces that do remain, they were very beautiful gardens. They were they were well designed, and they had exotic plants in them, which from they got them from wherever. They had a feature of water uh, and with lotuses and things like that. I think that would be my choice, really. <laughs> Excellent. Well, sadly, we don't have a time machine for you, but uh, that's a great answer. Thank you very yeah, much. That's a really nice uh, nice note to, to end on as well. Thank you. Yeah, it would be absolutely amazing, wouldn't it, to have to go back and see these things. So it's so all we've got time for this evening. 